All right. So hello, people in digital video land. Uh, and, and thanks for the heroic efforts with the JPEGs from Hong Kong. And uh, welcome to Glamorous Ibiza. Uh, this would be me, Bruce Sterling. I'm a science fiction writer who has the term cyber in his curriculum vitae. Uh, as you can see from this book cover of Mirror Shades, the Cyberpunk Anthology. And I'm here to lecture on video uh, about the future of cybernetics for 40 minutes. And there's a lot to say. Uh, and if you're a science fiction writer like myself, of course, you're supposed to say astonishing, mind expanding, incredible things, as opposed to, you know, soberly discussing philosophy and ontology and epistemology. But I, I decided to try doing the opposite. I'm going to talk about the future cultural milieu in which cybernetics uh, might have a revival. And I'm going to offer some hints that might be of practical use or, or maybe even daily use to philosophers of technology if such a thing were to actually happen. So here in slide number two, picture number two, please. <clears throat> We have the original source of the problem in cybernetics, which is Norbert Wiener's famous book on the systemic commonalities between the behavior of animals and machines. There it is. Uh, this was a seemingly obscure scholarly mathematical book that aroused tremendous popular enthusiasm. You know, basically the, the cybernetics book behaved in this following way. If we can see image three here, please. Yeah, okay, this is the beloved image uh, by, from the Gartner Futurist Group, the Gartner Hype Cycle. And in my opinion, all philosophers of science ought to have this image tattooed onto themselves. Uh, and I, I admit there are some serious problems with this, with this diagram. I mean, first of all, it's often not objectively true. They, they don't really, technologies don't really behave like this all the time. And second, this is how a technology might behave in a democratic capitalist society with a, uh, a rather centralized media structure, uh, which is not the society that we actually have at the present time. And third, it is futuristic in tone, but it's not anywhere futuristic enough. Because as time expand, extends along this x-axis, the this so-called plateau of productivity, which seems like a nice end to the story, uh, it falls entropically apart into obsolescence and technical decay so that a more honest diagram might look more like picture number four here, if we can see number four. Yeah, uh, there is no plateau of productivity. In the philosophy of technology, the technology goes to the junkyard. And it's actually the philosophy that tends to last. Technology is made out of metal and philosophy is made out of ideas. So the problem with these futuristic worldviews, like the Gartner hype cycle, is in the demographics they were designed for because the Gartner hype cycle is created for investors or venture capitalists. It's about the need to profit from innovation as opposed to like observing innovation and understanding what actually happens so if you are a philosopher of technology, you really need to move that so-called trough of disillusionment that you can see in picture three. And then the diagram works very well for you. If, if we could see number three again, please. Yeah, just move the disillusionment to the beginning before the technology trigger. I mean, you're already disillusioned before the technology, because you're a philosopher, you don't want to embrace illusion. Um, you, you're pursuing wisdom. You're not pursuing hype and illusions and profit. The trough should be where you live. That's, there's not a lot of cash down there. But for you, it's not even a trough. For you, that's the higher understanding. Now, in philosophy, it's extremely common for ideas that are hundreds or even thousands of years old to get refurbished with a new verbal coding on some very old ideas and impulses. And that's why I think that cybernetics may have a future because of its metaphysical aspects. So cybernetics can die in this 
in this uh, marketplace of machinery. Maybe cybernetics never even reaches the plateau of productivity, but it can return to the agora of public ideas. And there's already been a first order of cybernetics in the 1940s, and then a second order of cybernetics in the 1970s. So there might conceivably be a third order of cybernetics or a fourth order of cybernetics. And I plan to discuss that here. However, it's important to understand that this is very common, really especially common in the world of industrial computation. It's very common for metaphysical ideas to be productized or, or, or technologized in the information industry. And then they just fail abjectly. They just disappear in mass disillusionment. And yet they spring up again. And I'll consider it not just cybernetics, but virtual reality. How many virtual realities have there been? And also what could be more metaphysical than a determined attempt to supplant reality? But it's, it's not about computation. It's, it's about reality, which is a metaphysical concept. And sometimes it's renamed and relaunched, like with the metaverse uh, from the meta company. But, you know, what, really, what could be more metaphysical than renaming your computer company meta? And, of course, artificial intelligence is also intensely metaphysical because it's about making thought into artifacts, artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence began in the 1950s, and it's very famous for having winters. It just dies horribly. In some ways, worse than cybernetics died. All funding ceases, people are fired, people despair of the effort, and yet AI comes back again and again. Artificial intelligence is back now. Uh, in this year, you know, 2040, and it's never seemed more glamorous, more profitable, even though today's large language models and uh, machine learning foundational platforms have rather little to do with the original technical aspirations of the Dartmouth workshop on artificial intelligence way back in 1956. So can, I, can we see slide five, please? Yeah. Yes, here it is. Here, here they are. There's artificial intelligence, contemporary artificial intelligence, springing back from its winter, a spring, a summer. And if artificial intelligence can come back in this flourishing fashion, then it's reasonable to imagine that cybernetics might also somehow come back because artificial intelligence was actually an attempt to rebrand cybernetics with a more strict terminology and more practical engineering approaches and, and so, on har hardware and software. And the Internet of Things is also metaphysical because to name things is basically a metaphysical problem. And humanoid robotics are metaphysical because they have the Norbert Wiener interest in the commonalities of humans and animals and machines. Who can replace a man? Do androids dream of electric sheep? I mean, these are literary questions, really. Uh, and robots are not a science. Robots are a theatrical invention from Czech theater. Robots are 100 years old. They were made up by Karl Chopek. But even though human humanoid robots have never worked except as glamorous stage puppets, there is a fierce investor interest in reviving humanoid robots right now. I mean, people are dropping hundreds of millions in venture capital on far-fetched notions to get these humanoid things to get up and walk, especially the new large language model robots. Because it's assumed that since they have self-learned how to talk, they might be able to self-learn how to walk or self-learn how to move their arms. I mean, large language models talk all the time. And now that they've successfully fat passed the famous Turing test, well, that was a metaphysical test, the Turing test. So, and so here they are, here in slide four, these, these large language models, the new ones, there's kind of a lot of them. And this chart is just a year old, but I think it's important to realize, I mean, and to internalize the idea how many of these models are already dead. They're just defunct. They're discontinued. No more money. You, you go to their website, there's a 404. There's nothing there. They are defunct in that S-curve sense. 
They are outdated. They are abandoned. They have rusted. They have rotted. And just a, a few years, months, really. So artificial intelligence as a metaphysical concept never seems to die, but artificial intelligences as actual functional artifacts are extremely frail and imperiled. 50 or 60 years of historical artificial intelligence models, hardware and software, is being annihilated across the board as we speak. You know, people like to compare machines and animals. That was the original point of cybernetics as a field of interest, trying to find some systemic commonalities there. But these huge, expensive machines are not like animals. They, they have the lifespans of small mice. And the greatest success of this modern large language model AI means the mass extinction of traditional AI. Every AI that ever acted like an animal before is just gone. They're, they're, they're annihilated. It's a, a, it's a great extinction of previous AIs. And, and this is quite a melancholy story. I mean, it's a, a difficult thing to realize. And at this point, I, I have to veer from my technical presentation uh, because, yes, I, I am a novelist. <laughs> Whenever novelists show up among scientists uh, or technicians or engineers or programmers or venture capitalists even, the novelists commonly have one truly useful thing to say, which is the human condition is tragic. The human condition is tragic. You know, and philosophers commonly get it about that tragedy. I mean, that's not a surprising thing for novelists to say to philosophers. However, among cyberneticians, there's this pervasive urge to escape or, or transcend the human condition because that seems sensible. Because with a cybernetic perspective, if machines are like animals and we can engineer machines, then we can engineer animals. We can engineer people, and we can engineer the living institutions of people, such as cities or institutions or national political arrangements. Now, historically, cybernetics arose in the direct wake of World War II, where there had been a deeply tragic mass slaughter of humanity, and the atomic bomb hovered over the battlefield and the civilian cities. And the people in cybernetics had somehow survived that very serious war. And many of them were veterans of military or espionage work for the victorious allied powers. Uh, so, you know, to speak as a novelist, what were these human stories of these original titans of cybernetics version one? I mean, the, the tragic human condition of these famous technical people, such as Norbert Wiener in picture number six, please. Yes, that's Norbert Wiener's book there. And there's Norbert with one of his favorite cybernetic devices. Or Warren or John von Neumann, picture seven. There's von Neumann with a device. Warren McCullough, picture number eight. There's Warren, the rebel genius. Heinz von Ferster, Picture number nine. Yes, there's Heinz with the device. He's very cybernetic. Ross Ashby, Dr. Ross Ashby. Handsome fellow, very nice machine there. Gray Walter. Gray Walter, the neurophysiologist and machine maker. Very handsome fellow. Walter Pitts. Absolutely the most tragic figure in cybernetics. It, it's incredible how maladjusted this poor fellow was. Uh, Margaret Mead, the only woman in the group, the very charismatic and compelling Margaret Mead, and Gregory Bateson. There were others, but these are the figures who remain somewhat famous today. And I have to tell you that their human fates were not pretty. So if you were telling yourself as you watch this video, well, I... I want to become cybernetic. I want to live like the, the people of cybernetics, volume one. They, they, were, they were full of brilliance and brio and, and intellectual invention, and, and they were, but this is the tragic lifestyle that you are asking for. Uh, Norbert Wiener, he was an extremely intelligent man, but he was quite a doer and suspicious person who felt betrayed by his friends and colleagues in cybernetics. And 
he had cut ties with them socially and he abandoned them and he died in exile. And John von Neumann was just a searingly brilliant computer scientist just there at the very beginning. Uh, but he was obsessed with nuclear weapons rather than computation. And John von Neumann died young of metastatic cancer because of all the atomic bomb tests he had personally arranged and personally witnessed. And in his final days on his deathbed, he was quite demented from brain cancer. And then Gray Walter was a neurologist who had worked on curing brain injuries. That, that was his medical research effort. But Gray Walter also liked to invent little cybernetic robots that could scoot around. And Gray Walter owned a scooter. You know, he owned a Vespa, Italian Vespa motor scooter. And he liked to zoom around on his fast little machine. And he fell off of it. And he broke his own brain. I mean, he just cracked his head open in a motorcycle injury. And for another seven years, he was basically crippled. He, he never recovered from the coma that he had been in as he damaged his own head on a scooter. Walter Pitts, just an extremely eccentric character. Just weird. He's a person who was superb at math and logic, but basically autistic. He was so paranoid, so shy, that he could scarcely feed himself or shelter himself. And eventually, Walter Pitts burned his research papers and drank himself to death. Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon invented information theory, but he died of Alzheimer's disease. He just slowly but completely lost his mind. Ross Ashby, he died of a brain tumor. And then there were Margaret Mead and uh, Gregory Bateson. And these two were social scientists. They were anthropologists, just intensely charismatic people with tremendous personal skills, great people skills. And Margaret Mead here was almost the general secretary of cybernetics. She was the only prominent woman in the group. And she was famous for being the only person who would listen to everyone in cybernetics and understand everyone in cybernetics. She was an anthropologist. She was kind of trained to sympathize with alien viewpoints. She didn't have anybody to talk. She didn't have any trouble. If you could talk to nobody else, you could always talk to Margaret and be heard. And Margaret Mead was American and Gregory Benson was British. So they were kind of a World War II allied couple. They were like the NATO victors, just a terrific duo. They, they had a child together. They were sage-like figures as a married couple arriving together. They were overwhelming. This had tremendous social and scientific credibility. However, during the cybernetics boom, they got divorced. They just couldn't put up with one another for some reason. They split off. They wandered off into opposite directions. And I should also mention Dr. Gordon Pask, who's another cybernetics pioneer. He was an artist as well as a scientist, Gordon Pask. He was a theatrical person, really. He came from a background in performance art. And Gordon Pask was such a bizarre and eccentric character that even science fiction writers were impressed by him. Okay, these were all... These are all real people. I mean, they were human beings, mortal people. They left real human legacies. For instance, Gregory Bateson was the mentor of Stuart Brand, who was the publisher of Whole Earth Review. And Stuart Brand was the mentor of Kevin Kelly, who was the editor of Wired Magazine. And Kevin Kelly used to hire cyberpunk science fiction writers as technology reporters. That was his deliberate policy. He, Kevin Kelly really thought that science fiction writers should be acting as reporters for the digital information business. <laughs> uh, and it worked. I mean, a lot of cyberpunks were in the Wired magazine orbit because of Kevin Kelly, the, the disciple of the disciple of Gregory Bateson. And that is a, a rare, direct, human, multi-general connection between these original cyberneticians of the Macy conferences and cyberpunk science fiction writers. And it is an authentic connection between cybernetics and cyberpunk, but it's not scientific or institutional. It's very personal, very literary. It's about writing and editing. So, you know, that was the cybernetics of the past, melancholy business, 
But suppose that cybernetics were to revive again in the future, you know, what, what might that look like? I mean, that's the topic of my presentation here, really, future of cybernetics, <clears throat> to speculate about it. Uh, now, if I wanted to supply some serious, in-depth answer to that question, as opposed to like a brief video presentation, let me tell you what I would try to do. Uh, first, I would get some help. I wouldn't do it all by myself. I would try to assemble a working group of interested people, maybe 15, 20, 25 at most. And I would not predict just one future for cybernetics, like the future of cybernetics. Instead, I would, I would explore methodically. I, I would simulate four different possible futures for cybernetics, a, a quadrant of worlds, four of them. And we would gather together and we would perform some futurist exercises together and we would examine the conflicts, basically, probably the conflicts between digital culture as we understand it now and a possible cybernetic culture and how they would be the same and different. And four worlds are better than one because we are judging and weighing the future possibilities and like how might things change, how are four possible changes different. Okay, in one possible world, one quadrant of these four four possible worlds, it's very digital, and yet it's also very cybernetic. They're just coexisting at the same time. And in another future world, it's very digital, but cybernetics has been forgotten. It's of little relevance, just barely there. In the third world, digital as we understand it has become obsolete, it's old fashioned, it's archaic, while a revived cybernetics has taken over the world and is, and is dominant. And in the last world, both cybernetics and digital industries are both in ruins. They're just both archaic, like fax machines in a junkyard along with the Univac computer. It's just the board has been erased and it's a very different kind of world indeed. And that would be the forecasting exercise, imagining these four future worlds and their characteristics and how they differed from one another and how people might respond to that. And I would also have some deliverables for this exercise, not just pictures of a world, but something relatively concrete for the work you create together. And I would unite the participants among their various multi backgrounds by challenging them to design characteristic artifacts from these future worlds, not just design the world, discuss the world, but discuss objects and services in the world. I would, no, not on broad philosophical terms, but by designing specific things, objects and services. And it, it often helps that these objects or these diegetic prototypes are, are seem quite, com, quite humble. I mean, not, not elaborate and fancy, but common everyday objects, even sometimes abject objects, like say a shoe, like what does a cybernetic shoe look like in the year 2052, for instance. And it seems to help this process if the parameters and constraints are extremely specific, like absurdly specific, like a pair of shoes for a seven-year-old girl, and she's from the city of Macau, and they are athletic performance shoes. You see, you want to focus the creative attention of the workshop participants so that they forget about their disciplines and what they already know, and they do not quarrel in some vague way about abstract definitions. And to do that, I would use the techniques which are described in this book, the Manual of Design Fiction, which is picture 16 here. The Manual of Design Fiction, second printing, paperback. Uh, this is a big book, the Manual of Design Fiction. I don't have time to describe it or all the hijinks going on in there, but I would strongly recommend it to philosophers of technology. I think you'd find it full of useful and practical knowledge and surprises. And I'm a novelist, but I, I found these design fiction techniques to be very useful in my creative practice. So we might ask, if there was a future cybernetic world, you know, the, the world, the future world of cybernetics three, what kind of objects and services might appear in there? And if I had enough time, I might personally invent some and because I'm a science fiction writer. I like to have props and gadgets in my stories, but instead I'll just trouble you with this design school diagram. Uh, next slide there, please. Yeah, the anti-conventional objects diagram 
now this diagram is, is a way to escape the box of normal commercial products and services and to confront a much bigger material culture world of possible products and services. And you, you might see that this is a Venn diagram and it maps the production processes of a free market consumer society. We don't actually have one of those in the year 2024. That's not what consumers are actually living through. Instead, they are in a techno feudal big tech oligarchic society with a revived cold war and a lot of blockades and embargoes among the trade blocks. That's what's actually going on. So this, this diagram, even if it looks dazzlingly complicated, is actually somewhat archaic and corny. It's kind of too simplified. You know, it, it, it looks universal, but it's actually parochial. I mean, for the Soviet Union, for instance, had plenty of actual conventional objects, but they were not produced or distributed in this way. And, I'll, and these circles, these sort of large encompassing circles, buildable, desirable, profitable, public desires, you know, uh, productive technologies, some kind of, of reward system to keep the wheels moving. They are ductile. They're not Euclidean circles. They change all the time. They're more like clouds. Uh, and sometimes they change very quickly and very radically, like during wartime emergencies. And you can even postulate very different kinds of circles, for instance, where Ambitious artificial intelligence machines have taken over the world, and AIs dominate the means of production and finance. But even if you do assume that, I mean, what is on the breakfast table? I mean, there's still quotidian problems. Uh, unless every human is extinct and no one is eating, there will still be conventional objects on the breakfast table because the breakfast table is a center of conventionality. People are there every morning. So the center of these circles may move around, but the circles by their nature always have some kind of center. And that's how I would likely approach the future of cybernetics within a workshop. Uh, you know, this, this diagram here indicates that future objects are a kind of shotgun blast into the future. They, they tend to diffuse and spread. There's no like one single perfect analytical answer. <clears throat> But it's clear to me that the founders of the original cybernetics were facing very similar problems. Uh, they themselves were also struggling to imagine the future of cybernetics and, and with very limited tools. So they would have conferences and meetings about it, like the famous Macy conferences, and they would assemble multidisciplinary experts from many different walks of life, and they would come up with some principles of like systems analysis and try to figure out what this meant for different disciplines. And those that was the point of the Macy conferences. However, in, in these scholarly meetings of the 1940s and 50s, mostly they just shouted past one another. They struggled over semantics and definitions. They, they couldn't seem to get to a point. So they would present papers about psychoanalysis or neurosis or the meaning of language or hypnosis and what it might be, or animal calls and animal signals, or statistical noise and information. But it was pretty clear that nobody was actually listening to anybody else, with the possible exception of Margaret Mead, who would listen to everybody. Cybernetics never became a unified discipline of its own. It was a conference of disciplines where people mostly discussed speculative ideas. However, these cyberneticians also took refuge in designing and building specific cybernetic objects. And commonly, these were small, cheap devices made of leftover scrap. And these objects, these cybernetic gadgets, were kind of their proof of concept for them. And also, these objects could really focus public attention. And I still find these very remarkable, like number 17 here, the Norbert Wiener Paolo Mila moth device. Yeah, there's Norbert. There he is with his Paolo Mila moth. He's very proud of it. He was often seen photographed with the moth device. Or number 18, the Claude Shannon Theseus maze running device. Yes, Claude, the master of information theory. He was very interested in how animals could behave and get through 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 labyrinths. That was a very common psychological study. Put an animal 
people in the labyrinth, see how it behaves to this definite challenge. So he built a mechanized electronic mouse called the Cius. And you can see him demonstrating it on YouTube videos now. If you look for Claude Shannon and his the Cius, he's, he's very proud of this little animal gizmo that he's made. He's kind of delighted with it. The Ross Ashby homeostatic device, that's number 18. There's Ross with actually four of his homeostats. He, he built one and then he continued to build other ones and link them to the other four. He, he really liked the way they interacted. And then number 19, the very famous Gray Walter Tortoise, probably the most famous cybernetic device ever made. The star of the show in the heyday of cybernetic robotics, this little tortoise used to run around uh, pursuing lights, light signals, and recharging itself like a little autonomous beast. And it behaved, it, it, it displayed very animal like behavior, even cute and friendly looking and animal like behavior, given that it was a very simple machine with no onboard computation, just you know, really just. Uh, uh, well, you can you can look up the circuit diagrams. They're astonishingly simple for the Gray Walter tortoise. And number 20, the really quite magnificent Gordon Pask Colloquy of Mobiles from the Cybernetic Serendipity Art Show in London in 1968. You can, they actually took the trouble recently to rebuild the Gordon Pask Colloquy of Mobiles uh, after 50 years. They they rebuilt an almost perfect copy of it and it got it to function. Uh, very famous thing, kind of, kind of a, I don't know. Uh, it, it's 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 really a kind of um, breakthrough in interactive device art and 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 a kind of ancestor to a, a lot of contemporary digital artworks. But none of these robots were digital. They were all analog. They were all cybernetic, and they all were technological paths not fully explored. Just paths not taken. And if there were a third cybernetics in the future, I think that it would likely arise from one of the areas where cybernetics was heavily involved, but digital technology has not been much interested. And I would suggest that there would have to be some new research breakthrough, some, some really kind of primal new discovery that would capture the imagination of scientists and would have some intellectual glamour. Uh, but these breakthroughs are possible. They do, in fact, happen. And the original cybernetics arose from a theoretical breakthrough. And it might maybe a breakthrough in, say, animal physiology or some medical neural discovery about the function of human brains, like some exciting basic revelation about human natural intelligence. And if that were to happen, then I think it could easily compete with the glamour of artificial intelligence. And we'd, we'd see a, a great deal of social interest in and natural human intelligence and how it might be altered or developed in some way, engineered. And cybernetics also have political organizational aspects, such as the Stafford Beer Project Cyber Sign. So one might imagine some future business ma management model or new political movement that renamed itself cybernetics or wanted to take on cybernetic characters. And their political manifesto might sound something like, well, we are technocrats, but we have become unhappy with the established big tech platforms and their surveillance marketing. So we'd like some alternate form of political feedback and political command and control that's more straightforward and that elucidates political issues directly. So they're not digital and they don't involve computers. Instead, they are information flows. There's sometimes somehow also legal structures. And you can imagine a political movement kind of developing from there. And I'm speculating here. Uh, and these prospects may seem rather far-fetched and abstract. However, I myself do have some personal problems that are clearly cybernetic because I'm the art director of a technology art festival in Turin in Italy. And in our city in Italy, the city of my festival, Torino, our Turinese public, they're very fond of device art and machine art. The Turinese just really like programmable, movable objects and interactive installations. And this form of art just seems to suit the cultural tenor of the city of Turin, which has always been keen on manufacturing. So I grew very interested in this kind of machine art and device art. 
and I feel the need to, uh, and even the duty to like understand it and and uh, encourage it. However, kinetic art and machine art and device art, they're very poorly theorized. I mean, the language is very difficult and uh, and, and kind of diffuse. And there's not a canon. Now, it's a form of art that's that's very popular. It's popular in the way that like the Gray Walter tortoise robot was was popular. It's very appealing. It has very many different interest groups that follow it. And also very different scales of mechanical activity and complexity, such as very small fidget toys for the hands that just kind of do cute little kinetic things or executive desktop toys for the desktop scale or model train sets, which move around. They're, they're active. They're like little mechanical theaters or Alexander Calder mobiles, which are the most famous form of kinetic art or Bruno Minari useless machines, which are the most Italian form of kinetic art. It has a long heritage, you know, and a lot of artistic participants. And also many cyberneticians had these little pet machines these of some kind. They were struggling to prove something publicly by building these one-off devices that could orient themselves in time and space and manage somehow to stabilize elaborate processes in elegant ways. And, you know, clearly that's a cybernetic issue. And I've spent a lot of time trying to understand this myself. I mean, occasionally I write about it. Mostly I just research it and think about it. I, For instance, I've argued in the past that robots as a category are science fiction theater. They're theatrical objects. And re robots basically impress us because they are puppets that resemble us. And our, our our fondness for robots actually gets in the way of some more advanced technical scientific understanding of what it might really mean to have autonomous machines with multiple degrees of freedom that can maneuver in three-dimensional space. And I, I struggle to understand how you might do this well, you know, in like a genuinely appealing way, you know, an aesthetic problem. You know, and, and, and aesthetics is metaphysics. You can't really have an aesthetics without a metaphysics. So I'm concerned with the aesthetics of the systemic commonalities of machines and animals. And, and, and that's very clearly basically a cybernetic problem. That's, I mean, to understand kinetic art or to attempt to understand kinetic art is, is very much in the cybernetics camp. It's not about understanding software or even hardware. It's more about understanding how these work. And, and I have the intuition that there is some grand unified theory of kinetics that would somehow unify a lot of these disparate phenomena like robots and Calder mobiles and maybe the movement of water in public fountains or older movement arts that people carried out, such as ballet or martial arts. You know, and, and I think that such a theory is in fact possible um, and that it is a cybernetic problem. And I, I'm starting to think that taught technologies such as artificial intelligence, software, and digitization actually get in the way of a proper understanding of this artistic problem. We have never seen a true and graceful biomechatronic art because we've always tried to squeeze things through the von Neumann gate of digital computers. So it's a creative cultural situation where I myself truly lack good answers. I'm every bit as stymied as the cybernetic theorists of cybernetics number one in the 1940s. Now, I, I know that very early on, there were kinetic artists like Nicholas Sheffer who were making cybernetic artworks that moved on cybernetic principles. And they would send these artworks to Norbert Wiener and Wiener would reply, well, also that's, that's a nice artwork, but cybernetics is a science. And, and I understand that classic C.P. Snow, two cultures distinction. And I know why Norbert Wiener would want to say that to an artist, but I think that may have been a cultural mistake. Uh, computers had a computer game industry that very much helped them, but cybernetics never had a cybernetic game industry. Uh, and cybernetics never became a scientific discipline. And even computer science isn't much of a discipline because it's the only science that is named after some specific device. So I can intuit the need for a third cybernetics. 
and a third cybernetics might be of some genuine and practical use to me. I might become very happy if it appeared. And now in conclusion, <laughs> I will trouble my audience with some practical recommendations because I'm a novelist and yet I have the long habit of carrying personal tools. And as it happens, one of them is called cyber. And this image here, my last image, is the Victorinox cyber tool. We might see that now. Yeah. There it is. The, the beloved Victorinox cyber tool. As you can see, this is an analog multi-tool for someone who has computer interests or cyber interests. These cyber tools were first introduced into the market in the year 2000. So for most of the 21st century, I made a habit of lugging one of these around. And they were named cyber because they had specialized bits these, and the little plastic holder there and the the bit driver, screwdriver. Um, and they were specialized for electronic devices. And I knew a lot of people involved with electronics and electronic artworks. So that was my cultural milieu. I'm, so this is a cyber tool for a cyberpunk. And I would even argue that it is something of a Professor Yukoi cosmotechnic device. Now, I think that multi-tools are particularly interesting objects of analysis for philosophers of science, especially the more extreme ones, like this Victorinox champ that you can see here. Yeah. Okay, here you've got an overly multiplex personal device that is clearly utopian in its inspiration. It's, it's imperialistic, even, because it's trying and failing to provide all technical solutions to all possible citizens all at once. You know, it seems to offer a comprehensive set of solutions, but in actual practice, this device is quite clumsy and awkward and difficult to grasp and even somewhat hazardous. So for many years in the 21st century, I, I was happy to be a cyberpunk with a cyber tool in my pocket. And I would even say, that this was an act of identity politics on my part. I would even say that it was something of a status affirmation and, and a form of pocket jewelry that was there for display. But then I realized that the cyber tool was two decades old and that some of the earlier models had become obsolete and were no longer produced and that multi-tool evolution had continued in different directions, such as the Leatherman Arc, which comes in an entire kit and then has even more bits than the than the Victorinox uh, 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 champ, except they're in a little assembled structure that you kind of strap to your body. Or the work champ, which I, I actually use most of the time here in Ibiza because it's more functional. It's kind of concentrated on construction work and doesn't pretend to have any digital tie-ins whatsoever. And I've even been known to carry actual knives and actual pliers, which are relatively simple and effective and not so dazzlingly ideological as these very peculiar multi-tools, which, which are very much of our era and kind of products of the Cold War. And I would, I would point out that multi-tools are really not much good for actual functional engineers or construction trades people. They're simply not big enough. They're awkward. They lack efficiency. They lack mechanical accuracy. However, they're extremely good tools for critics and analysts because they're a set of keys, of, of levers into the technological environment. They're kind of mobile. You can do a great many different things with them. You kind of never run out of analytical objects. And they're quite good, not at constructing machines, but at deconstructing machines. They're actually good for dissection, for pulling things apart if you don't know what they're for. So they're not particularly good for business, but they're great for cultural analysis of technology. So I stopped carrying merely one. And these days I carry a wide variety of multi-tools. I, I tend to stockpile them. 
Sometimes I carry three or four different ones at the same time because I've understand I've come to understand the very different kinds of ways that people can relate to machines. And Norbert Wiener once said that learning was the highest form of feedback. And if you carry a technological interface, you will learn to interface with technology and kind of feedback with it and through it, and not with the digital methods of a cell phone and it's too many apps, but in the analog methods of an analog analytical tool. So if you are a professor, a, a, a philosopher of technology, I would urge you to make a habit and to make a moral virtue even of carrying a technological interface with you. Do not restrict yourself to cyber nostalgia. Be willing to use entire sets of tools, be a multi-tool kind of scholar, acquaint yourself with them, including the varieties which are no longer manufactured and have gone out of service. Those are, in fact, of a special historical interest. And I, I really believe you will do very well by that practice. And it will prepare you for the future in a way that very few other simple things can. I happen to be a professional fantasist, but this is truly practical everyday advice. I do carry multi-tools every day. And if a novelist of technology could do it, then a philosopher of technology could probably do it on a higher plane. And that's what I have to say today. So thank you for your attention.